Hello, welcome to the Monday, July 24th, 2017 edition of the Santanet Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Washington, D.C. I'm here at Sands Fire, of course, this week. Now, if you are attending, we do have our handler panel in the evening on Monday, 7.30. It starts. You need to have a conference badge in order to attend. We do have about a dozen different handlers present to talk about what we sort of saw of interest uh, last year. Also, Mark Sachs will be attending with his collection of crypto machines. I think it's probably not one of the largest private collections of crypto machines that he'll bring along, including his Enigma and a number of other rather unique machines. But in other news, we do have an interesting diary by Didier. Didier is writing about how ISO attachments are being used to infect users with a malware. Typically, ISO files are, of course, uh, images of CD-ROMs or DVDs. And now, in this particular case, these ISO files will be mounted automatically by recent versions of Windows, which will then expose malicious executables that are contained within the ISO file. Didi is talking a little bit about how to analyze uh, these attachments, how to extract uh, the executable uh, from them. So if you received any attachments like that, of course, you may find it helpful to get you started in figuring out what the attachment exactly contained. And then Didier also was lucky enough to receive another Office document that was spreading link files. Now, in a prior diary that he wrote that looked at one of those link files, there wasn't really much metadata in it. In this latest example, he has a little bit more data telling us more about about the particular author of this sample. The machine name was Frank, and we also have a volume ID and a MAC address. Now, the MAC address tells us that this particular sample was created in a VMware machine. Of course, the bad guys use virtual machines just like the good guys use them to analyze them, but uh, this particular sample at least has a little bit uh, more of this metadata that uh, typically is associated with link files. Now, last week I talked about an attack against an Ethereum wallet that really didn't involve sort of cryptocurrencies at all. It was a very simple web defacement where the attacker just swapped addresses for wallets. Late last week, however, we had a second attack against a couple of Ethereum wallets that, uh, unlike this first attack, did involve a particular vulnerability in the Parity 1.5 implementation of Ethereum. The problem here affected multi-signature wallets. And now multi-signature wallets typically are used in order to confirm transactions with multiple signatures. In this particular case, an implementation flaw, however, did allow an attacker to take over ownership of the wallet and then completely train it. Several million dollars worth of Ethereum coins were lost in this attack before some white hat hackers stepped in and trained these wallets off their remaining value, which I believe, if I read it correctly, is somewhere around $30 million. Now, they still have to return that money to the proper owners. That'll take some time in order for them to, again, set up wallets that these owners have access to. One of the issues here was that Ethereum does actually allow for complex scripts to represent contracts that are being executed when you're transferring Ethereum. Now, with these complex scripts, of course, come complex vulnerabilities. And one of these vulnerabilities was triggered in this particular contract script. I will link in the show notes to a complete description of the attack. I really only very briefly summarized it here. If you're more familiar with how Ethereum works, how these contracts works, then you may be interested in the more complete write-up in order to understand what the exact vulnerability was about. Well, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again 
tomorrow. Bye.